Start out with a, a little bit of a story. I got a I got a really great uh, telephone call, probably one of the best in my career, uh, about a week and a half ago. It was one of those evenings when it was way below zero, and uh, I, I was just settling down in front of the fire, and I got a call from a client, and he said, oh, I've, I've got a beef cow, and uh, it's got a prolapse uterus. It's laying out in the in the pole shed out here. Uh, can you come out? And I said, Oh man, I said. I'm sorry, I, I just retired from uh, private practice and I sold all my equipment. You'll just have to call the clinic. And then I poured another glass of wine. So <laughs> it makes me even more thrilled to be here in this relatively new capacity as the Secure Pork Supply Coordinator for Minnesota. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, the possibility of a foreign animal disease and how we'd like to prepare for that. So the Secure Pork Supply Plan is a voluntary program to provide a workable continuity of business plan for commercial pork producers that's acceptable to state and federal animal health officials while providing a safe supply of pork for customers. So that is the basic framework that, uh, that we're looking at. So this, you have to understand, is a, is a work in progress. It's, uh, it's something that's being developed um, with the help of both industry, state and federal governments, and uh, academia. So it's a partnership that's uh, funded in its development by USDA and APHIS and the National uh, Pork Board. But the implementation is the responsibility of the state. And so I'm actually hired as a contractor by the Board of Animal Health uh, to try to implement this uh, program and spread the word. It's voluntary. And the whole key phrase to this is continuity of business. And continuity of business in the swine industry it revolves around being able to move pigs. That is the key to maintaining business. So <clears throat> when we look at this key phrase, we need to be able to move pigs to slaughter or to the next stage of production. And that is the key to maintaining business. And it's a work uh, in progress. So we want to uh, get some feedback from producers to find out how we can improve the project. And that is also part of uh, my responsibility. So I was challenged by one of my uh, veterinary colleagues. He says, well, what is it? What am I going to tell my clients? What is it that you've got to sell? And uh, so I said, well, that's a good, challenging question. And really, we want to lay out the expectations of animal health officials that will give producers the highest probability of being able to move their pigs. And I say highest probability because it's the responsibility of the state animal health official to actually make the final decision. But by uh, participating in this program and doing the preparation, you're going to have the highest probability of being able to uh, accommodate, and we'll talk about that later. And then also to give producers the tools to respond to the possibility of a, uh, a foreign animal disease crisis, which is what it will be. So I'm going to start out by making the acknowledgement slide early, because I have stolen all this information from these people with their blessing. And uh, so I'd like to... Uh, point out the appreciation of Minnesota Pork Board, National Pork Board, uh, Board of Animal Health, uh, veterinarians uh, Greg Suskovec and Beth Thompson. Uh, Pam Zabel down at Iowa State has worked on developing this. Uh, Marie Culhane at the U and uh, Clayton Johnson has offered some uh, additional information for me at the end of my presentation, so I appreciate those. So what is my role? Uh, first of all, I've been challenged to basically generate awareness, and that has to do with this uh, PowerPoint presentation I'm giving you today. I've met with uh, several of the major systems in the state. I've talked to veterinary uh, groups and uh, client meetings like this, and there's going to be some tabletop exercises coming up as well. And then eventually, we also want to facilitate participation. Uh, having been in practice for 41 years, I understand what it takes to motivate um, a producer or a farmer, and the whole idea is to enable and to facilitate in a way that is reasonable and doable. So I've tried to compile this into a, a situation where we have three different modules that you can get your arms around it and more easily put into what might be considered a, a prelim preliminary compliance, if you would, with the ultimate goal of eventually enrolling in the Secure Pork Supply Plan uh, program. And um, the enrollment 
process really is not ready yet, and it's going to be several months yet before we can actually do it. But virtually all of the information and all of the activities that are going to be required for enrollment uh, are available to us. So that's what we're going to be talking about here today. And then, of course, gathering feedback and helping to improve the program as we're going along. So the goals of today, we're going to uh, explain the risk, talk about some of the anticipated costs, uh, and the implications of a foreign animal disease, uh, identify some of those diseases that we're going to be looking for. Uh, we'll go through uh, an, an outbreak scenario. And uh, then to encourage you uh, as producers and uh, some of the veterinarians that might be present as how we might be able to participate. So what's at stake? We've got 60,000 producers marketing 110 million pigs in the United States. Uh, it represents a lot of gross receipts. Uh, we support a lot of jobs, and uh, we are contributing a significant amount to the uh, gross domestic product. But this is the key. Since I started in September, the number of exports has grown from 25, 26 to 27 percent. And after some information that we've heard uh, just yesterday and also at the Lehman Conference, uh, with what we've, uh, are, with the expanding pork uh, production, it's probably going to be 33% or even more of the exports. And of course, if we have a foreign animal disease, all of those things will stop. Most of our, the, of, of our, the people who, is buy, who are buying our pork uh, from overseas require that it's, uh, that we're free of foreign animal diseases. So that is a big, big issue. And in Minnesota, we have the additional situation that we really have kind of a limited shackle space. So if we have to sell our pigs to a packing plant that's out of state, that means it's an interstate shipment, and that means that we have to respond and be uh, willing to uh, accommodate uh, the animal health official in a different state. So that adds to the complexity of the whole issue. So what's the cost? <clears throat> uh, Iowa State has done a most recent uh, study on this. Uh, $12.8 billion for the first year if it's a foot and mouth disease. Uh, Scott Dean put a slide up yesterday that said $16.5 billion for uh, uh, African swine fever. And if we add the uh, situation to our last speaker who represented soybean uh, uh, industry, uh, we have some additional costs. So the estimate is about $200 billion over the next 10 years if we are faced with that kind of an issue. You compare that to our most recent foreign animal disease outbreak, which was the high path avian influenza in 2015. Uh, we had to depopulate 50 million birds at a cost to the taxpayer of $1 billion. And you compare 200 billion to 1 billion, and uh, according to Greg uh, Suskovic, this uh, was the worst animal disease event in United States history. We just soon keep it that way. Add to that the emotional cost. Uh, many of you who are uh, producers may have had to experience the problem and the emotional problem of a PED outbreak where you had all those baby pigs that were dying or had to be euthanized. And if you uh, look at some of this, this is a terrifying example of the emotional cost that would be added on to the financial cost that we're dealing with. And it's been interesting to me as I've read through the material that we've got here that uh, the, the information on this secure pork supply has really included uh, quite a sensitive and compassionate approach to uh, this issue in the, in the guidance. And you, you wouldn't really expect that from a government uh, type of, of uh, document that has been included. But uh, they recognized that after the United Kingdom outbreak in 2001, there was a high incidence of, of suicide. And you add that emotional cost to what's already a huge financial loss, we've got a very significant problem. So what are the, the uh, foreign animal diseases and pigs that we're concerned about? Uh, foot and mouth disease is the one that's most commonly talked about. Uh, classical swine fever or hog cholera. Uh, African swine fever. And uh, all of these are reportable to uh, OIE, but none of them are a public health concern. Not that that would be, not that that would matter to a very skeptical public. Uh, this information would go out, and of course the, the public would respond in a very negative way. So foot and mouth disease uh, is probably the biggest one. It affects all cloven-hooved animals. Uh, the thing that's interesting about this in pigs is that 
A lot of times it may ca not cause a high death loss, and uh, uh, it, it's uh, considered the multiplier. Uh, it, it's very rare that a pig would get infected by aerosol, but once it's infected, it generates huge plumes of virus. So if you took an infected pig or a load of pigs that was infected with foot and mouth disease and you drove them down the, down the road, there's this big plume of virus that you're going to be shedding and uh, the uh, cattle and, and, uh, and uh, small ruminants would be highly susceptible to the aerosol infection. So this puts a, a, a big significant burden on swine producers um, as to exactly what would happen for a foot and a mouth disease. Clinical signs are something that many of you probably recognize. It's a vesicular disease. Um, it's mainly the blisters and erosions on the feet and legs. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, these same clinical signs, because they're identical or nearly identical to Seneca virus A. And uh, the, the signs are indistinguishable. We've got to assume that it's foot and mouth until we're proven otherwise. Uh, it's been endemic in the United States in the 80s, but we've uh, found that we've had a series of outbreaks since 2015, which has been a real inconvenience to the industry and the packing plants and the producers trying to sort that out. It's been a good exercise for us because we've actually gone through what might happen in the event of something like this. The problem is, is it's become so common that we could easily become very complacent uh, about the issue. Uh, foot and mouth disease was eradicated in 1929, but it was back when we had all these tiny little farms uh, going around. The industry, of course, has changed dramatically from that time. And uh, it's still found in two-thirds of the world. Even though we've got it eradicated from our most closest uh, affiliates, uh, it's still endemic in, in many parts of the world. Uh, hog cholera uh, is a, a septicemic disease, a viral septicemic disease. And uh, it was eradicated the year, uh, officially eradicated the year after I graduated from vet school. So I didn't get in on any of the uh, windfall of vaccinating pigs for hog cholera. But it's still uh, around as close as the, the Caribbean. And it's one of these uh, diseases that could be easily confused with erysipelas or salmonella, some of the other septicemic type diseases. But uh, it's one that we definitely need to, to be aware of. African swine fever is the third disease. And I, it's been described to me as classical swine fever on steroids. It's got the same type of septicemia, but uh, dependent upon the strain, we can have 100% death loss uh, in, in some of the pigs. Severe, severe septicemia death loss. But the pigs that recover from it are going to shed for the rest of their lives. They're going to continue to shed and be carriers. This is a particular concern because in, in Eastern Europe, uh, there is a big problem with African swine fever in Russia, and the, the issue is moving uh, west uh, into the other uh, Baltic states and so on. And a big part of it is that they have a resident population of uh, carriers in the wild boar population. And so this has been made it very difficult for the control. And it's also an extremely hardy virus. Uh, Scott Dee's work that he presented yesterday, and I'll mention again, uh, African swine fever was one of the viruses that not only survived in a lot of the feed ingredients, but it also was the only virus that survived in the container without any substrate, without any additional feed issue. So uh, the thing is, is really durable, and it, it's a, a, a real high potential risk for us. So early recognition is critical. Uh, you want to be aware of that. Uh, vesicular diseases, basically anything with blisters, and unexplained septicemia are the two broad categories that we're looking for. Uh, remember that indemnity payments, if there are any, are only going to be based on uh, live animals, not to uh, dead animals. Uh, the uh, uh, poultry industry found this out. Uh, the poor producers that first experienced the high path avian influenza came out in their turkey barn, and uh, the animals were good for uh, at noon, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they had huge death loss, and they were wondering, what in the world's going on? And none of those got paid indemnity because they're dead animals. So that was a big response that they had to figure out in a hurry 
to make uh, sure that we got the diagnosis uh, up front. And uh, it is a legal responsibility for veterinarians and for clients to report any uh, suspicious cases. So what's the risk of entering? <clears throat> uh, I mentioned that foreign animal disease viruses are common around the world. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, international travel, uh, people clothing, uh, equipment and food. Uh, we have quite porous borders, really. Uh, and and uh, a lot of uh, stories I've heard from talking to people who have uh, come into the country uh, may have inadvertently brought in food from other countries that may be carrying this, and they just can't pick it up. And uh, so, um, and, and it's the same with all of our, our shipping industry. Um, Scott's work that he presented yesterday morning uh, talked about how viruses can survive both a trans-Pacific and a transatlantic journey. Um, and uh, so this is a, is a high risk. And then you add to the situation where we have a million pigs in the road in the United States every day, and seven and a half million of them come into Minnesota. And we have a naive population. So uh, they've never been exposed to this. So that means they've got no immunity. Uh, it's going to be a big impact uh, across the, the whole scenario. So most people who've studied this figure that it's not a matter of if, but when. So what would we do in the event of foreign animal uh, disease that was diagnosed? On day one, uh, first of all, we are, as a country, are responsible to notify OIE, uh, all of our other member countries. And in the case of foot and mouth disease, all the exports of cattle, swine, sheep, goats, and their uh, uncooked products are going to be stopped. Uh, in the case of classical swine fever and African swine fever, which are only swine diseases, it would be restricted to pork products. But, of course, as we mentioned, with the export markets reliant, we're relying on that, uh, that would be a big deal. Prices would drop. We'd have a lot of pork to deal with. Consumer confidence <coughs> would also drop. Now, in the event of a foreign animal disease, this is a top-down emergency. Uh, unlike a situation, for example, where the hurricanes or tornado or flooding, uh, those are all local events that are, we try to manage locally and then call in outside help uh, if it's necessary. In the event of uh, foreign animal disease, it's a top-down situation where the government is involved immediately because of the implication on the national swine herd and uh, on the, the entire economy. So there are a number of tools that we have available for us to, uh, to control a foreign animal disease. First, uh, stop movement to prevent a foreign animal disease from leaving a site. We have biosecurity to prevent it from entering. We have stamping out, which has been one of the conventional approaches where any infected animal is euthanized or immediately destroyed. Uh, we've got trace back issues to try to identify where the animals, uh, where the issue may have come from and where it may have gone to in the interim. And that's based on a lot of information that's necessary. Uh, we need rapid diagnostics. We have diagnostics to differentiate a lot of these things at the diagnostic lab, but what we don't have at this point are validated uh, diagnostics for large sampling, for example, like the oral fluids uh, situation. And that is being in, uh, in development. And vaccination is another tool. Uh, now, this is the one that has gotten a lot of press most recently. The problem is that uh, foot and mouth disease and classical swine fever vaccine, uh, although there are those vaccines, they're not readily available in the United States. So that's why there's been a big push by the industry, AASV, and uh, National Pork Board to try to establish a, uh, a vaccine bank that would be available uh, to us. Uh, there is no vaccine for African swine fever. And the, uh, I talked to somebody at uh, a conference in Chicago and uh, who worked on African swine fever, and that particular virus does not respond well. It's very difficult to get a vaccine that's effective. So that's going to be a, a bigger challenge when we really don't have that tool available to us. In any case, there's going to be movement restrictions. Um, there are control areas that are going to be established. Um, and the animals in transit are going to have to land somewhere. Uh, I was visiting with uh, some of the uh, people from Hormel yesterday or last evening. And uh, they think, OK, I've got a shipment going to a, another country. Uh, we get a diagnosis. Is that ship going to have to turn around and come back to port? What are we going to do with all of that stuff? Because 
immediately, it's going to affect our export markets. And, and the big issue for producers is that we may need to manage the animals uh, uh, for, a, for a, a period of time before they're able to move. So that's the big issue. So this is a control zone that's a schematic that would be the case for an avian influenza. Here's the infected site. It's usually a three kilometer approximate diameter or radius uh, that would be the infected zone. Then there's a buffer zone of seven kilometers and then 10 kilometer uh, radius for the surveillance zone. So this is the area of concern. Of course, you don't really know how that, that, uh, those areas would expand based on uh, when, where and when the outbreak was identified and where animals had come from and gone to afterward. So it might not be just a, a very localized area. So this then would be the responsibility of the government officials trying to determine, once a diagnosis is made, uh, what is the phase and type of the foreign animal disease response. Phase has to do with the amount of time since the uh, outbreak occurred and uh, <clears throat> type has to do with the extent and severity of the disease. So this whole uh, issue about what type of response we're going to make is dependent upon the phase and the type and that classification. So that's, uh, that's something that's important to understand. So let's make a quick comparison of some of the strategies. Uh, in 2001, the UK had an outbreak that I referred to earlier. They used stamping out approach, basically had to kill anything or euthanize anything that uh, was infected or suspect. They t ended up culling 10 million animals, and it cost them uh, about $9 billion of direct costs. According to Wikipedia, the additional costs ran to $16 billion. This was the, from what I've been told, was the most costly event in the United Kingdom since World War II. Big, big issue. You compare that to Uruguay, that uh, smaller country, but it had an outbreak in 2001. They used vaccination as their control measure. They limited the animals that they had to dispose of to uh, about 7,000, and it uh, limited their cost to control at 240 million. So uh, big changes, and, and our, the officials that are managing this are looking at these as, as significant issues and learning from it. The big problem in the UK is that they destroyed a lot of animals, perhaps needlessly. Uh, the one estimate is around two million of that 10, and another one was up, an estimate of up to 45% of the animals were destroyed, perhaps needlessly, because they were probably uninfected, but they were close enough and considered a high risk. And they didn't have in place any kind of a, kind of a continuity of business plan. So that, was a message to us that said, we've got to figure this out before the same kind of thing can happen to us. So there are many challenges, of course, to uh, this. Uh, first of all, to the producer, uh, there's some have to bother with the implementing the biosecurity. You have to manage uh, the animals. If they can't move, figure out an alternate plan. And of course, the other thing is, uh, if you've got a system that's moving animals back and forth, and there's an outbreak that's been identified over here, are you going to be willing to take animals from the control zone that are supposed to come into your area? Um, it's going to work both ways, and that's going to be a, a big concern. Additional challenges to the producer, of course, are the increased mortality, uh, the production costs. Uh, uh, some people have thought, well, I, you know, I got foot and mouth disease. They're not going to die. They're going to recover. But they never recover to full production, you know, whether you're a dairy cow or whether you're a pig. Uh, that production is not going to come back to 100%, even if they recover. Um, we also have uh, issues with uh, contracts. So we have to think, well, what's going to happen? Do, how do I fulfill the contract if uh, I get a, a foreign animal disease? Delivery to packers, feed purchases. How am I going to get my feed if uh, I can't get a truck onto our site uh, reasonably? Similar challenges to uh, the state health officials that have to figure this out. They need resources. The big thing they need to make a reasonable decision on your behalf is information. They need to know if they're going to issue a movement permit, they got to know a lot of things about what happened on your farm. And that is uh, one of the big issues, as we'll be seeing in the Secure Pork Supply Plan. Um, USDA has similar challenges. They've got limited resources. 
Uh, they have to establish what the size of control area is going to be. Uh, the traceback information is going to be required. And they're going to try to control uh, the cost uh, of responding to an outbreak as well. The Packers, I uh, visited with uh, a couple of them here at the meeting. They've got the same things. They're going to try to protect the brand. Uh, they've got market for their process products. They've got biosecurity issues for their employees and their truckers. Um, they're also going to have to figure out how they're going to manage contracts that are expected uh, or for delivery and, and how, are, how sensitive are they going to be for contracts that other people perhaps can't fulfill uh, in, in dealing with this. If they have to lay off a bunch of employees because of it, what are they going to do with that? So the Secure Pork Supply Plan has been developed or is in the process of being developed to try to aid those herds that are affected by the outbreak but not infected by the disease or the virus. So that, uh, and, and all these complicating issues are the things that are developed. You've seen this slide before as the main uh, goal and the purpose of it. And it's part of actually a number of secure uh, food supply plans. There's one for dairy, for milk, there's secure pork, uh, secure beef supply plans in the works, and uh, secure poultry supply for both, uh, for eggs, broilers, and turkeys, of course, has been prompted because of their recent uh, problem with the high path avian influenza. All of the things, all of these pro programs have similar goals. It's a pre-outbreak voluntary preparedness to prevent, detect, control, and contain. And the continuity of business, again, is to minimize the unintended negative effects of a disease and disease response while achieving the goals of, of the response to the, to the outbreak. Uh, we really need to enhance communication and coordination. Um, I think uh, the, the work that we've done with our uh, voluntary PERS and PED control measures has added a collaborative attitude to the industry. And uh, this is one of the things that hopefully is going to continue to carry over into a situation that we might have to deal with here. We're looking to uh, tr provide risk-based solutions based on science uh, that's, that's good science. And we want to control or eradicate the disease without destroying the industry. And I think this is something that uh, all of the officials that are very aware of this concern. So most of this information or all of this information is available at securepork.org. And it's a great uh, website. It's been updated as of the uh, beginning of this year. It's got all kinds of information that's available to you. But the, as I've gone through this, it, you know, from a producer standpoint or veterinarian, uh, it may be somewhat overwhelming. So that's why I've tried to condense this into a facilitated possibility uh, into three modules. And uh, the first one is traceability and movement management, which involves uh, premises IDs, transport uh, records, so keeping track of, of all of those in, that information. Uh, enhanced biosecurity is the second one. And the third is foreign animal disease identification, training, and response. So three basic concepts that uh, producers need to be aware of to participate uh, eventually. So we're going to spend a little time going through uh, each one of those. First of all, uh, traceability and movement management. Uh, the goal is to balance the benefits of restricting movements, which is known to uh, reduce the spread of the disease with the cost of interrupting that business, both to the threat of uh, uh, the loss of business problems and the animal welfare issues of having to hold animals that there's no place to go with them. And uh, of course, with, uh, there's just a constant push. Uh, we have, that's a, a tough balancing act. Uh, again, those control zones are going to be established. This is more typical of what one look like. Uh, as compared to the perfect circle that we examined. But again, it's, uh, it's got an infected zone, a buffer zone, and a control zone. And any movement in or out of those areas is going to be controlled by permit. So traceability and movement, the, the fundamentals of this is first and foremost to get a national premises ID number. And we're, we're really ahead of the ball game here with the pork industry because apparently 95% of our producers have a pin that they uh, use and uh, can use. So that is step number one. Uh, then it's a matter of maintaining the records of where the pigs have come from, where they're going, 
uh, both swim, uh, swine semen and human traffic. And uh, a lot of the information, and, and I know I've, I've already talked to a number of systems, and of course a lot of this information is readily at hand. They, they've already got a lot of this information available. And, uh, but for people who don't have it, there are, are forms that are available on the website. And we really can't overemphasize the daily use of the PIN number. And one way that I think, uh, you know, in, in talking to people in the short while I've been doing this, um, everybody's got a pin, but very few people know what it is. And uh, if we can, one slick way to do it is, uh, even though a lot of uh, the information might be electronically transmitted these days, but for example, uh, uh, any of the health certificates that might be written by hand, or uh, most of the lab reports that go to the lab uh, need to have that on. And if you identify or collect and get a barcode associated with it, uh, it's going to be a lot easier to, to recognize. And it's a simple process to do it. Once you get your, um, your PREM ID from the Board of Animal Health, you can go to pork.org, you go to Programs, uh, Premises Verification, and you follow the instructions to get a, a PDF barcode file. So you can download this, your own specific barcode, and you can download it and you can put it onto a, a format that uh, you can print right at home. You just figure out whatever kind of uh, labels you want to put it on. So you can, uh, you can just peel that label off, put it on your uh, veterinary diagnostic lab report or any health certificates or any paper-driven material, even uh, putting it on uh, delivery uh, situations, you know, delivery documentation. So it's a slick way to uh, get that, and if your handwriting is anything like mine, most of it's in Ill uh, illegible by the time we, uh, you know, get to the third copy. So this is, uh, I think, uh, something that is a simple step. It's readily available that can be used by anyone. And while you're there, you may as well validate your premises location. It's at the same uh, step on the pork.org, um, and you can validate this with at the National Pork Board. Uh, basically, what you're doing is confirming latitude, longitude, and 911 address. So, if you're having a heart attack and you call on 911, you want to have them arrive at the address where you are, where the pigs are, not where the address might be three or four miles away, which is sometimes the case when we've gone through to identify this. This is particularly a critical issue that has been explained to me. Uh, where there are producers that might be right on, on the border between Iowa and, and uh, uh, Minnesota or South Dakota, you might have a, a, a geographic location that is on one side of the border and uh, a 911 address that has been assigned to you that's in a different location. So in that, re in that situation, you have to put a little asterisk by it and say, okay, we really need to identify latitude and longitude so that uh, all of these sites can be, be easily and readily identified. And uh, eventually then, that information will be dumped into the uh, EMRS system, but that is the responsibility of the state. So if you collect the information uh, and give it to the state in whatever format's available, then they will be responsible for managing that, and we're working at systematizing that a little bit better. So traceability is, uh, again, we have to identify the, the breeding stock and animal group movements. Uh, we're really recommending or encouraging people to use electronic uh, health certificates or CVIs. And uh, the, the veterinarians or people that are on the Board of Animal Health uh, uh, information path have just recently gotten uh, 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 a little letter that uh, was sent out that has options for electronic CVIs. And it's really uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, you know, there's different options. Some of them are free. Some of them are uh, basically to be paid for. But if we have this in electronic format, it's going to be far easier uh, for an animal health official to manage that and make some decent decisions. Um, your eventual goal is going to be to complete an epidemiological questionnaire that looks something like that. Again, to enable health officials to make some reasonable choices on your behalf. The other thing that might be necessary and probably is going to be required is that there's going to be a quarantine period before and after so that uh, you can observe the animals uh, before they're coming in or after something has arrived from a, a, a zone 
and make sure that that has not infected other animals and show off some clinical signs. So the bottom line with that is that you're going to have to hold animals for longer than you might otherwise want to. And that is going to be an added inconvenience and, and uh, an issue to think ahead. Uh, regardless, um, before animals can move, they have to be a monitored premises. And uh, the uh, movement then can resume after the permit has been issued. There's a number of factors that have to be involved in trying to issue this. And I, I go through this because we want to be in the minds of a, somebody who has to make these decisions. And so to accommodate that, uh, first of all, the destination must be agreed to accept the risk of taking animals that, for example, might be in your control zone. Uh, and if it's a slaughter facility, if it's a packing plant, they have to be willing to accept animals because they don't want to run the risk of contaminating their plant. The incident command officer, who's actually managing the, the thing, it might be the state animal health official, someone else has to be willing. And both state animal health, health officials, both from the state of origin to the state of destination, must be willing to um, accept and move the animals. And that decision is going to be influenced by a variety of different things. Uh, the bottom line, or the big thing, is that it's going to be we have to persuade them that the degree of confidence that these animals that are intended to move are not infected. Even though they might be from a high-risk area, that is going to be the key. And it will also depend on the phase, the extent, and the type that we've talked about in the past. So um, all of these issues are, are rather complicated in trying to make uh, a reasonable decision. So that's why we add the caveat that participation in the program offers the highest probability of obtaining a movement permit. And I know producers don't like to hear that. They say, okay, I've done all these steps. You told me that I should be able to move the animal. And then somebody says, no, you can't. But the, the issue still has to be with all of these uh, concerns put together uh, in, to uh, try to manage and make that decision. Um, and that is going to be determined by the official in charge of the, of the situation. Um, we're really trying to, you know, a big part of this is to open the discussion, uh, to try to standardize the expectations. And I think this is, is a, a, a big deal because um, in, in my practice career, working with partnerships, um, working with relationships of any kind, if we can anticipate conflict and try to have the discussion prior to it becoming severely emotional, we're going to make a whole lot more progress. And I think this is uh, the situation that we have to deal with, uh, particularly when we're working with interstate movement and, uh, and having this discussion now so that we can say, okay, what would you anticipate you're going to need from us to guarantee that we can get a movement permit in and out of your state? And, uh, you know, some animal health officials might be more reasonable than others, but having this discussion now is going to help to minimize that situation. So, first one is traceability. Get a PREM ID, keep track of the information. Second one, enhanced biosecurity. There are four bi basic concepts that are emphasized. Have to identify a biosecurity manager. Um, have a written site-specific plan that's uh, documented with documented training. Uh, and it, is, it basically involves uh, a perimeter buffer area uh, and a defined line of separation. All of these uh, are common in bits of information that are being already implemented on most of your farms, so it's nothing new. The thing that's unusual about foreign animal disease biosecurity is that it's got to be more stringent for foreign animal disease than for the endemic diseases that we've got, like PERS or PED or some of these other things. Mainly because the endemic diseases, a lot of these animals have had some level of immunity in the past, and we know that with our experience with PERS is that there tends to be less of a new outbreak if we've got some immunity on board. Um, in a, endemic diseases, there are low levels of pathogen shedding and high levels of innate resistance or immunity. In a foreign animal disease, we've got no herd immunity. And once we get infected, there's going to be huge amounts of shedding. So that means that we really, our biosecurity has to be ramped up uh, to a little bit higher level than what we would uh, be looking at otherwise. So the producer's responsibility is to protect their own herd. The regulatory official's responsibility is to protect the national herd. And both of them are going to be pretty conservative in trying to figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to manage this. 
The good news is that we put together uh, this biosecurity self-assessment checklist. And uh, again, it's a, it's a means of trying to enable relatively easy participation without a, a heck of a lot of inconvenience. And I like the, the situation on the bottom of this where uh, you can check off it's either in place, you've done it, or it's in progress, or it's not in place. And a lot of these things that might be too inconvenient or might be too expensive, it's just a matter of thinking through. Okay, what am I going to do? Uh, I don't have it in place now, but I've thought through it, and this is what I'm going to do if something like this happens. And I think that's a big part of it. There's uh, some detailed information on the uh, information manual. And uh, the, the biosecurity manager's responsibilities then is to, first of all, be aware and understand foreign animal diseases and the production site. So a lot of times this might be the, the production manager or the manager or the farm manager or uh, the, farm, the owner. Uh, that's going to be the biosecurity manager. You can use uh, <clears throat> the, the checklist that I mentioned in the information manual. And there are a couple of templates that make it quite easy. All you have to do is fill in the blank. I like this. It's multiple guess. You just uh, fill in the blank, and you have the document available, and uh, it's ready to go. And that, uh, again, is a, a matter of enabling it. It does have to be a site-specific plan, and you might be uh, using your herd veterinarian. And uh, you're also responsible for training your employees. And then the thing that might not be available on, on some sites is how do you ensure compliance? What's going to be the, the, the repercussions of non-compliance? And that's probably something that uh, might be lacking in a lot of farms. So <clears throat> just to run through some of the expectations on the biosecurity plan, uh, there has to be a diagram. And there's uh, suggestions about how to get this diagram from uh, uh, going on uh, Google Maps or something to get a, uh, a picture of it. And then we draw the lines in there as to animal movement, identifying where the uh, line of separation is and the perimeter buffer area. Um, all of these, there are some examples that are, are on there. And many of you have already got this identified uh, on the site. And you're well aware of perimeter buffer areas, which is the big zone, uh, the first level of defense uh, around the farm. And then perimeter buffer access areas for both equipment and supplies how you get through those areas to access the site. And then, of course, the line of separation is generally the building doors and uh, the walls. And uh, there are also access points that have to be identified and how you move equipment, supplies, people through those sites as well. Um, the, the plan, the biosecurity information manual goes through uh, access points, uh, details about moving vehicles and equipment, uh, cleaning and disinfection statements is some, uh, stations is something that's expected as well. And this is something that probably, uh, certainly on a finishing site, is not going to be uh, something that's going to be on site. And one of the things that I've thought of and, and would suggest to veterinary clinics or to systems is that you go through this and say, okay, this is the expectation. How could I devise one on site in a short period of time? You know, get a high-pressure washer have the supplies, keep it all in a box or in a room in a central location, and if I need it, here's where I go to get it. Uh, because it, it's uh, overkill, perhaps, to, to try to put one in place, and, and that's not expected. But to go through the thought process and say, okay, this is what I would need to do, and here's my plan. This is where I'm going to go to get the stuff. Uh, carcass disposal, of course, is going to be a concern. And, of course, if it's, a, if it's a huge death loss or we have to euthanize a large number of animals, um, we have these options that are available. And uh, for large numbers, it's probably going to boil down to burial. And uh, there we're going to be uh, dealing again with uh, environmental uh, issues. But in this is the case when I think our regulatory officials are going to be able to get together and offer some assistance because they can negotiate on our behalf and say, okay, here's our situation. We've got to do, deal with this. We uh, may have to alter the regulations temporarily to manage this situation. And uh, that's where I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile. But thinking through this is, is something that is, uh, is expected. Uh, managing manure, if the outbreak happens in the fall, uh, we've got overflowing lagoons. What are we going to do with this manure that's a potential source of, of infection? Uh, rodent control, of course, is a, a common issue. 
and feed. How are we going to get feed into the place? Uh, what's going to happen in the event of a spill? How are we going to manage uh, that situation? And then uh, training for your employees as well. Uh, and there are materials that are available for this. There are biosecurity posters that you can put up and a fair amount of information. There's a nice packet that you can get free of charge by going to pork.org, the National Pork Board, and you can order them. They come in about uh, two days. It's, it's amazing. And they're all free and available to, to be used. So the third part of the program, the final part of it, is foreign animal disease training and response. Uh, first of all, you need to identify what, uh, what they are. What are the diseases? What are the clinical signs? Um, there's a lot of uh, lesions and posters that are available. Uh, I know a lot of uh, uh, you do postmortems on your own farms. Um, there was a presentation yesterday with the Swine Vet Center explaining a lot of these things. Know what to look for in these postmortems. Know the things that are going to frighten you if you open up a pig and say, oh, this is different than anything I've seen. Um, visual surveillance is expected and documented. That basically is look for the lesions, know what to look for on the farm. And then there's surveillance testing. Um, uh, they're just not going to be enough uh, people from the Board of Animal Health or even their local veterinarians to be able to come and collect these samples. Uh, many of you are doing this on your own farms, uh, whether it be blood or, or oral fluids. Again, we're trying to uh, identify uh, validated testing for oral fluids, which would be the most convenient way. But again, we're out there trying to prove a negative, and that is a big, uh, a tough deal. So we have to try to figure out, well, how many ropes do we have to hang for the number of pigs, and uh, what are the expectations? So while that is being hammered out, um, many of the sites are already conducting routine surveillance, whether it be PERS, PED, something else. And uh, my thought is that the, uh, while these details are being hammered out, uh, maintain sample aliquots either on the farm or uh, at the labs. They generally keep those for a month or, or more. And in the event you have an issue, they could go back to those samples and test them because serial testing over time is going to give us the best uh, information as to reassuring us that our, our site is actually negative. Uh, I visited with Jeff Zimmerman at a recent conference, who of course is the, the guru of oral fluids testing, and they're working on this uh, with the, the government entities and with the National Pork Board to try to get this established. But most likely, it's going to be some type of, of serial regular uh, testing. Um, and we'll just have to figure out the numbers uh, of, to get the expectations set out. Sample collection, again, if we can train people on the farm to properly collect those samples, that is going to be a benefit. Because first of all, it's going to keep people out of your farm. And second of all, it's going to accommodate the needs of the animal health officials. Uh, again, you'll be filling out a questionnaire. And uh, this written contingency plan uh, has to include uh, different options for, for the possibility. So a big part of this is just think through the what if. What am I going to do? So again, I, I look at this from a producer standpoint. And you know, to be honest, a producer is going to say, well, this is pretty important, but it's certainly not urgent. And <clears throat> the problem is, is that this plan this issue can be urgent overnight once we get a diagnosis. So I've thought ahead, you know, being uh, you know a relative expert in voluntary uh, programs uh, and the limitations of voluntary control arms. I think, well, what are the roadblocks? What are going to keep people from participating? And of course, the number one is it's never going to happen to me. It hasn't happened for many years. It's not going to happen. Uh, no big deal. I first part of my presentation, I was trying to persuade you that. That may not be the case, so it, it's a higher risk. Going to be some inconvenience, obviously, and a certain amount of cost. Uh, one of the things that people that I have uh, visited with or intend to visit with are bankers, because they're into risk management. We've got to be able to say, OK, this is worthwhile investing some dollars to try to mitigate the risk that's going to protect your investment and theirs. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's an important thing. But I thought, as I, as I started to think through this, I, I thought back, well, let's compare this to uh, foreign animal disease with PERS. And I attended uh, the Lehman Conference, and Clayton Johnson uh, had a presentation. And, and the most encouraging thing about his presentation was we have the tools 
to control PERS. And if we can control PERS, we probably can control foreign animal disease. The problem is we haven't done it. So why has that been the case? And uh, he put together identified biosecurity issues, critical control points, and of course there's dollar signs attached with all those issues. And his conclusions were that the individual tools can't be applied haphazardly. We oftentimes apply some of them, but oh, we, it's too much of an inconvenience or too much of a cost. Uh, we're not going to do everything. Um, it's not cost effective. A lot of people said, well, I, you know, I can live with the disease more easily than trying to put all these barriers in place. I'm not going to do it. Some of the older farms just simply can't do it. You know, there's no way to filter some of the older farms. And compliance, of course, is always an issue. Uh, they're just, it's really difficult to maintain 100% compliance uh, across the board. My thought is if we get a foreign animal disease, there's going to be a strong incentive to use all the tools available. And the good news with all of our uh, horrendous uh, hassle with dealing with PERS and PED and some of these issues is we know what to do. And we can control those things. All we have to do is implement them. So it's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. We've already done that. We just have to apply what we already know. And uh, when I try to persuade somebody to accommodate or to participate, just imagine that your neighbor was just diagnosed with foot and mouth disease. That, I think, will be a, a stronger incentive. If you want to put the dollars to it, it's estimated to be about $137 million per year for the U.S. pork industry to keep it out. That translates into a $55 per head value to U.S. Post per, pork producers. This was before the, uh, we take into account the expanded exports. When we start looking at how much more the exports are, that number is going to do nothing but increase as to what the cost is. So the next steps, I'd like to have a take-home message. Uh, use your and validate your pins. Use them. Uh, generate some barcodes if you don't have them. Use electronic CVIs. Identify a biosecurity manager. And go to the www.securepork.org to learn the details. Or you can go ahead and contact me. I'd be happy to share those uh, PowerPoints with you. Uh, if that could facilitate, I'd be happy to visit sites. Um, I'm, this job goes for a year. I've got till next September to accomplish something. So uh, it's uh, free of charge to you to use the services. Uh, the board is uh, taking care of that until I run out of money or time. So I encourage you to use that. Take home messages. Uh, foreign animal disease is uh, reasonably like to, hap to happen. Uh, the consequences obviously are going to be pretty severe. Uh, you really need to identify and start looking for these because the earlier they are reported, the more likely we can minimize the consequences. Uh, this secure, secure pork supply plan is available to hopefully mitigate or minimize the consequences. And uh, voluntary participation uh, is hopefully going to be reduce the uh, impact. And we think that preparation is a good investment. So there's the uh, website again. And I'll take questions. And feel free to contact me. I've heard the term before. The, the question is, uh, is, does a foreign animal disease constitute a force majeure? Did I pronounce that properly? Uh, my suspicion is uh, that it probably is. Uh, is Beth here? She threatened to come in. OK, there you are. There's our legal expert. <laughs> That's a great point, because that's exactly the issue. So another question. Yep. So you referenced the source farm, the destination farm, both being willing to accept the risk, and of course the regulatory officials being willing to issue the permit. Has there been any discussion around sort of the pass-through states? For example, a lot of mean pigs will move across multiple state lines where they don't necessarily, um, they are placed in the state, in the state where one is required to travel through, and I'm just curious if there was any discussion around that scenario. 
Well, that, uh, the question is, uh, what about pass-through states? Usually a health certificate or a CVI is just determined, is established with the destination area. And that, of course, will be a, a critical issue <clears throat> to the possibility of foreign animal disease. I think that it's also part of this ongoing discussion. I don't know how that is being uh, addressed specifically, but again, we have differences in opinions and different personalities that are manage, managing boards of animal health. And uh, that's why that type of a question is really uh, important for us to address at this stage of the game before it becomes really emotional uh, to, to deal with. So uh, it's an excellent point, and I think it's something that's worth continuing in our dialogue with all these different parties. Yeah. You mentioned in your last slide that you thought an FAD is likely, or there's some probability around that. Is there any consider, uh, a consensus in the industry as to what percentage or some type of probability of an event like that happening? Okay, the question was, is there any consensus or uh, uh, concerns about uh, uh, what is the probability of entry? Uh, I think that there was a study that was done recently that asked uh, the question in a, in a poll of producers, uh, if the probability was this, how would you respond? If the probability was this, how would you respond? And uh, I don't remember exactly the, uh, the responses, but of course, as the probability increase, the likelihood of responding more aggressively is going to be the case. Uh, I don't know of any study that has indicated specific probability, but we've identified the risk factors, and uh, that is what has prompted this to say, oh, uh, shaking my head, and there is a higher probability than what we might feel. Yeah. How does that affect uh, potentially going forward in uh, that scenario as far as you can And then in your case, for example, how does that affect their ability to export? Well, I think in order to maintain your export status, you have to be certified as negative. You have to, you know, attain that status again. And the whether or not we use a vaccine, vaccine if, if an outbreak is identified in a small farm, and it probably is a place that, oh, somebody came, you know, they visited a foreign country, they brought a sandwich back, gave it to the pigs, and uh, they broke with uh, African swine fever. I had this horrendous death loss, and somebody I picked it up. That is going to be a closed situation, and we might lose our status for a short period of time until that is wiped out. They've done the testing all around. We get back on track in a short time. If it's in a big system that comes in on a feed delivery and uh, feed is delivered to multiple sites, we get a break in several places. And in the meantime, it took a long time to identify that this is a disease that took place. Maybe it's foot and mouth disease. So uh, in the meantime, uh, there's pigs that have been traveling across several state lines to get there. That is going to be a much bigger issue. And until they do the testing to find out, okay, how extensive is this? That determines the, the, the phase and the type, and that will also help to determine the, you know, whether or not we're going to try to just live with it and vac vaccinate our way out of it, or whether we can still stamp it out. And, uh, of course, the, the quicker we can respond and get back to a negative status, then our exports are going to uh, pick up again. But uh, my impression is that if you're designated as a positive uh, country, uh, your export market for those places are not going to work out. One of the suggestions has been that, um, well, maybe we should try to negotiate with our, our partners to say, well, this product is safe. Um, we have ways to test our product to reassure you that what you're buying is, is negative. Would you be willing to take that? We're not, honestly, in a very good negotiating position right now for anything more than let's keep the markets open. But it's uh, down the road, it's something that perhaps we should uh, try to consider. Particularly in the case, you know, how do we prove that our product is negative even though we've got areas that are, are uh, positive? So that, that would be another area to investigate, but it would require some 
pretty intense negotiations. And there are, <clears throat> of course, a lot of countries that uh, are out there waiting to step in and supply the pork that we might not be able to at that point. So, yeah, so big issue. To paraphrase that, the vaccine would be a tool to stop the shedding and the spread of the virus, but it wouldn't, wouldn't allow for export. No, I don't, I don't think that, uh, that by having a vaccinated status is still going to allow uh, the exports to, to continue. Under the current, uh, under my expect, understanding of the export regulations and the expectations from countries that are importing.